So, we'll begin. My name is Avi, I'm a user experience designer. I come from Tel Aviv. And as any good user experience designer, I like to be on top of technology. I like to keep informed of what's going on in, in, in the world of technology. And so uh, the team at Microsoft, which is one of the largest corporations in the world, and they've created what they call an envisioning lab, where they uh, get together and try to imagine what would be the future technology 20 years from today, maybe. And uh, that way, any company that thinks about the future, of course, is informed and is prepared for what's coming next. So they had this bunch of information uh, about what will be in 20 years, uh, in the year 2009, and some budget, and they decided to produce a movie that will highlight uh, this future world. And they call this movie Productivity Future Vision 2009. And in this movie, you see a uh, very interesting technology. This is a really large screen that you can touch and interact with during a flight. Uh, you see this uh, communication window, perhaps the future of Skype. Um, windows, you touch and they become interactive. Uh, this is the workspace environment. Uh, it's become semi-transparent. You can move and interact, manipulate things in the air. Uh, handheld devices that will replace our future, our phones. Uh, this made a lot of sense two years after the first iPhone came out. Um, so, a few years passed, and more information about technology, more, uh, more interesting things. I mean, these are a group of professors and, and uh, screenwriters and visionaries and technologists. They had more budget. The first movie was a really great success. I saw it, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. What can they come up next? And 2011 came around, future, Productivity Future Vision 2011. As you can see, the screens look much more fancy, the handheld device. Um, here is uh, another version of it, another very big ty type of technology you can attract on your lap. Work environment looks a little bit better. Uh, innovation here, uh, the screen actually projects further, so you can uh, you have a device and you can enhance the screen size. There's more, sc there's more chairs here if you guys want to come from the back. Um, here's another example of a screen. Um, this is a, a touch um, board that you can manipulate things, a magnetic board you can put things on. Uh, this is a calendar view. Uh, the smart fridge of the future, where you can see uh, milk, uh, when it was put in the fridge, and leftover, um, leftover pasta, and when it is expired and the carrot was ordered. And uh, you can interact with things in midair. You can just draw in, in midair, and it will project itself onto the screen. Again, very interesting. I was really amazed to see this. But it was a few years later, 2015, when I was eagerly thinking, what could be next? How could they improve uh, in, in the future? What other new information? Of course, the Internet of Things came around. And as we can see here in this few new, few new movie, uh, it's a wearable device, a watch that you can eat. This is actually a underwater. Big screens, all of a sudden, large screens. Um, that you can interact with, a device that you can fold, and a touchable, um, touchable window, I believe. This woman is at work. She's working, and uh, as you can see, I think the, late, the strongest, innov the biggest innovation here is that in 20 years from today, we're going to have very, very strong arms, because she's working all day long like this, <laughs> right? This is very great uh, thinking. And again, very big, big screens. This woman is communicating with her husband, and she is asking him, tell me, how is your knee today? And he's giving her the angle, you see? He's showing her the angle. It's just a really great conversation there. <laughs> so as you can see, and this is the work environment and so forth. So as you can see, um, something, there's, there's a common pattern between all these movies all these years. Can anyone tell me what it is? The screens. The screens are bigger, and there's so many screens. And it started like 2015, it started to be suspicious a little bit. I said to myself, this is where the world is going, where there's going to be more and more screens. This is a little bit problematic because we already have too many screens today. And more screens in the future, we are already like using this. These are on, the, on our wrists and in our, in our work environments and our phones and more screens, really? 
that's really becoming a problem. And to, in, in evidence of this problem, uh, an artist uh, named Eric Pickersgill uh, took photos of people using technology, using screens, and removed the technology from the photo. You can see this is a very sad photo, right? <laughs> Dinner time, <laughs> right? Um, very great, great stuff, great stuff. And th these are very happy people, okay? So it's a problem. And even further, I want to bring it closer to us, and I want to make you feel good for a moment and then make you feel very sad. Imagine that you want to take a trip and you bought the ticket, you're excited, you're ready to go, you board the plane, but you know, you know what you need to do? You need to, um, maybe everyone, take out your phones, take out your screen, take out your personal screen. Let's, let's feel this. So you're excited. You want, you're, on the, you're on the flight, but of course when you're flying, you got to switch to airplane mood. I challenge you uh, to switch to airplane mood for this conversation that we're having today. See how comfortable you feel about it. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, research done that we are checking our phone 150 times a day. This is the average check. And again, screens are, shouldn't be you know, overbearing our lives. I think technology, in my opinion as a, as a designer, technology should enhance our lives, not overbear our lives. And to bring this to the digital realm, uh, I want to talk to you about this specific product, this uh, smart door that has an app that once you tap on it, <laughs> you can open and close uh, the door, right? So this is, this is cool. Tell me uh, here, who wants to have such door? Okay, a few hands. It's cool, right? So let's imagine, let's imagine the scenario we own this door and I own this door, for example. And I had a really long day at work, I'm very, very tired. I had a stressful meeting. I want to just go home and relax. So I drive all the way through traffic, an hour in traffic. I get to my house, and I'm standing in front of the door. And what I want to do is, of course, open the door. So I want to open the door. I pull out my phone. I want to open my door. I tap to unlock. I, I want to open my door. I swipe, and I put in the, the, my key, my my. my my passcode. I want to open the door. I exit my last open group. I want to open my door. I exit my last app. I want to open my door. I search for the app to, for the door, right? I want to open the door. I um, find the app. I want to open the door. I tap the app. I wait for it to load. I want to open the door. I open the door. I want to open the door. I enter, right? So this is the steps it takes to use this type of technology. This is crazy, right? You might as well just take out your keys. You don't, I mean, this is crazy. So, 11 steps. And this type of, uh, this type of technology is what we call, or what Golden Krishna calls in his book, the best interface is no interface, screen-based thinking. Because what happens today is when a customer comes to us and asks us to, there's a problem to, to be solved, the first thing we do is we draw a box. As designers, we draw a box, we draw a square, and we try to solve everything within what we can inside the square. Right? We try to, import, you know, we try to put every, all the, solve the problem in the square. But this is actually wrong. We should just understand the context. Instead of drawing squares, understand the users, understand the context of use, understand where people are going to use it, and think about technology beyond. So this is called ubiquitous computing. This was already coined by uh, Mark Weiser, which is the forefather of ubiquitous computing. And he said that the most profound technology are the ones that disappear. They wave themselves into the fabric of our lives until they are indistinguishable from it. And to illustrate this, I want to show you this piece of very advanced technological um, doors. And I want us to focus for a moment. Look, at, take a look at this. These people are in the flow of technology. They don't feel it. It's completely invisible to them. But what's happening here is there is a sensor right there at the top. And the sensor understands the context of use. It understands that when we get close enough to it, 
It understands that it needs to adapt to our needs to enter or to come out, and it opens the doors. And we are able to use it without even thinking about it. So best technology is invisible. And with this presentation, I would like to introduce you to the era of invisible design. Okay, I'm going to try for the next uh, 30 minutes or so to try to, to, to highlight the technologies that I've seen around that perhaps could bring this era. And when we remove the screen, the experience becomes the product. This is what I would like to kind of inspire you to think, that we are not selling uh, feature-based technology, we're selling experiences. And this is how it looks. For example, another smart door, which is August, and I'm going to show you the movie. This is you. That is your home. This is your front door, and that is the lock on that front door. These are the people you let inside your home. The dog walker, the plumber, your two out-of-town friends, your little brother, and her. These are the two people you never let inside that door. One's a professional cat burglar. The other, your insane drunk ex-housemate. This one doesn't think he needs a key. And that one still has one. Let's face it, you don't have time to open the door for everyone. You can't, actually, which is precisely why you have August. August is the lock that requires no key, only an invitation. An invitation that you can give and take away whenever you please. Keyless, codeless, and completely secure, August minds your entry when you cannot. You'll be alerted when your invitee arrives, and you'll know precisely when he leaves. No more racing home to let your out-of-town guests in. No more having to ask for keys back. Your lock recognizes you automatically and opens without you having to do a thing. And for your friends, you just create an invitation and press send. Grant access for a day, or a night, or a week, even a month. And take that access away whenever you like. August isn't connected to your wireless router or even your electrical service, so there's no risk of downtime or system failure. Plus, you can always still open your door the old-fashioned way if you like. You just don't have to. Secure, seamless, simple. August. So using the key becomes the old-fashioned way. But what they're selling here, again, I wanted to, to emphasize here, that they're not selling a smart door. They're selling a way for you to just come home, like imagine in the old country time where the doors were always open and you were always welcomed, right? They're selling you a way to come to, just come to, to a welcoming house. Right? This is the experience they're selling here, because after using it for a while, you start forgetting it, and you just, you know, just open the door and walk in, right? This is the experience they're selling here. Another example is a, a smart light bulb. And of course, when we're thinking about a smart light bulb, we're always thinking, you know, we can change the color, we can switch it on and off with the screen in our pocket, really. And uh, this is a, an app that controls that. But really, does it, I mean, we really need this uh, for a smart light bulb. Is this, is this really smart? How, how often would you change the color in your room? What's this for? So meet Alba. Uh, it's a smart light bulb uh, that works a little bit differently. And how it wor works, basically in the morning, it wakes you up, it knows your alarm, and it wakes you up gently with the alarm. So you wake up fresh. And then during the day, bright light, so you're more productive throughout your day. It changes the color and creates a bright light. And at night, temperature changes, it's a bit more warm atmosphere, so you can have a cozy dinner with your family. And if you happen to wake up in the middle of the night, just the gently comes up, the light gently comes up, so you can see your way and not completely wake up. It understands the context of use because it has all these sensors, and it has intuitive learning. And eventually, after using it for a while, you don't, you just forget it. It's transparent, but it keeps you, uh, you know, more productive. It keeps, it gets your day a little bit better. Uh, another example for an experience base is, of course, uh, the, you know, the smart car everyone knows by Google. Let's see a video if you haven't seen it. It has no screen. You just tell it where you want to go, and it takes you there. All right? There's no screen here. <laughs> okay, Annie, here we go. Yeah. All right, Cody, let's go. There's 
no steering wheel in the way. <laughs> It was a big decision for us to go and start building our purpose-built vehicles for us. And really, they're, they're prototype vehicles. They were a chance for us to, to explore what does it really mean to have a self-driving vehicle. But in the small amount of time we've been working on it, you know, we have functional prototypes, and that's exciting. Oh, it's really cool. It was like really kind of a space-age experience. Oh, okay. You sit, relax, you don't need to do nothing. It knows when it needs to stop, it knows when it needs to go. <laughs> it actually rides better than my own car. Yes, <laughs> sure. What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around a curve and then accelerated in the, in curve. the curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned in <laughs> high school driver's ed. So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time hanging out with my kids or helping them with their homework, even just tending to them. So as you can see here, uh, the experience here is not the smart car, it is, and the design is around the, the, how smart the car is. It's not about the screens anymore. It's just about getting there. The experience is getting uh, where you want to go safely. And I want to show you where design is happening, uh, for example. I'm Priscilla, one of the test drivers on the Google Self-Driving Car Project. Our team is responsible for keeping the cars and other people safe while on the road and for providing feedback on how they perform in the real world. A big part of our job is to go out into the world and uncover all the potential scenarios that a car might encounter. Then we help the engineers teach the car how to best navigate each one. Here are some examples of situations that we regularly encounter on the streets of Mountain View, California. We have taught the vehicle to recognize and navigate through construction zones. Our sensors spot the orange signs and cones early to alert the car of the lane blockage ahead, and we can change lanes safely. You'll also notice the vehicle typically moves to keep a safe distance away from large obstacles, like this truck stopped on the side of the road. Now we're approaching a railroad crossing, which requires special care. Notice the red fence and railroad sign that appears to the computer as we approach the intersection. This means that we'll wait until the tracks are clear of other vehicles before proceeding. Our cars treat cyclists as a special category of moving object. Watch in this example, when the cyclist holds up his arm, our software detects the hand signal and predicts his movement into our lane. The car knows to continue yielding to the cyclist passing by, even when he changes his mind, multiple times. We still have more work to do, but it's fun to see how many situations we can now handle smoothly and naturally. See you on the road. So again, I wanted to show this movie because it's a great example of how design is happening off the screen, where we're thinking about how to bring people safely home. Um, so to re recap, a smart door lock welcomes you home. That's the experience we're selling. A smart light bulb making the most out of your day, and the smart car arriving safely to your destination. These are experience-based uh, without the screen. So how do we interact? And the question that always I asked, get asked is, how do we interact with these devices if they don't have a screen? This is very odd, right? So I want to show you some examples I found of interesting devices uh, from across the Internet of Things uh, that has no screen, but we can still interact with. Uh, an example is the cube sensors, which these are cubes that you put in, in, a door, in rooms around your house, and it gives you a variety of sensors in terms of like how loud it is, if there's a baby you can hear, you can monitor after that, or air quality and so forth. And I want to stress here that I'm not saying that in the future there will not be screens. Screens are always going to be. Uh, we're always going to see them, but they're going to be an auxiliary part, I hope, with, from the experience. We're going to add to the experience, or we, we still have them, but not all the time. And for example, with cute sensors, here's the app for, the, for this device, and it tells you where to open, if they open a window or the air quality. And if you don't want to pull out your, your device, your screen, basically all you have to do is pick it up, pick the device up, and shake it. And it tells you green light or blue light, everything is clear, air quality is clear in that room. If it's red light, it tells you, it gives you some information before taking out the screen. Red light, open the window. There's, the air quality is not great here. Another example, uh, sense. Uh, that you can interact with. Uh, it changes color as you move your hand. It's a smart alarm clock and changes the color every time you swipe above it and you can get some information about what's going on in the system instead of looking at the screen. Uh, <clears throat> Cone, it is a smart music player that learns uh, your music preferences without a screen. And how does it work? Well, to turn it on, just 
turn it on and you play. If you want to ask for a specific song. Play Heartbreaker by The Walkman. You just use a voice command and you give it what you want to listen to. And if you don't like the song that is playing. I'm not your Twist it and it gives you another song. So after a while, after using it for a while, it knows your preferences, it knows what you like, and all you have to do is turn it and play your favorite music without a screen at all. Um, and here's another example of a smart music player that does not have a screen. It's a wooden panel that all you have to do is tap to play. But they were resisting it. They were really resisting not having a screen here. And they thought, okay, we can't release this device without a screen. So what they did is that they have, if you flip it on the other side, it has a screen still. Okay, so it's in the middle. We're still we're still there. Okay, so uh, an interesting example. And do you remember this from the Microsoft movie when you can just interact in midair and it go goes into your screen? This is already available. I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know, what is this? If you do this, five, things would happen. If you just do this, all of a sudden things. Maybe this will not work, I'm not sure. It's interesting. But uh, there is another uh, a possibility, a thing, which is a device you put on your thumb, and then you make your hand an interface. And you use your hand to control. So for example, if you want to raise the volume, you do this, switch channels, your hand becomes the most intuitive interface, right? Uh, another technology from Google, where they use radio waves, uh, to detect when you're near a device, you can do things, interact in midair. This is kind of cool. Um, uh, OrCam, it is a camera that's coming from Israel. Um, I'll show you the video. OrCam is a small wearable camera that understands what it sees and then delivers that information to the wearer through a discrete earphone. By responding to simple gestures, the device can read any printed text, distinguish traffic lights, and identify approaching buses. It also recognizes hundreds of objects and can memorize new ones, even faces and places. Just like having a friend on hand to guide and assist with everyday tasks, this party. Every name is bold. It wasn't clear which stood taller, the Corinthian columns of the New York State Supreme Court or the towering figures of New York society who mingled beneath them at the kickoff to the 12th annual Tribeca Film Festival on Tuesday night. I'm Liat, I'm visually impaired, and I'm going to show you how the Orcom device changed my life. With Orcom I can find things easily. Ocean spray so basically, the world becomes an interface, right? Everything that we see around us, we can point to, and we can understand what's going on, and we can create interfaces around just the reality. Um, there are an abundance of, of remote, remote type of devices. Here's an example, a device that you can switch. You don't have to use a screen to switch on and off the, the uh, uh, the, the lights, lights. This is how you turn it's on helpful. your smart lights with Numo. Simply click the middle surface to turn the light off or turn it on. Use the ring to adjust the brightness or configure the capacitive touch surface to show a color that you like. So there are many devices like this to control uh, not just the lights, the television, the air conditioning and so forth without the screen just like manipulating the environment, the smart environment around us. Uh, time tracking. It is also very challenging to, you know, we all track time at work. We usually open a spreadsheet or open an application, put in the time that we want to uh, track and so forth. But there's an easy way without a screen at all. It's basically, it's very quick, so I'm going to explain. It's a device that you put on, it has uh, four corners, and whatever corner is at the top, this is the tracking you see. It's 
basically notifying the system that you are working right now. And then she takes the coffee break, and now you're tracking the coffee break. It's kind of cool. So with no screen, just kind of not notifying the system through this type of device. And why not keep it simple? Just one button. Don't let running out ruin your rhythm. Introducing the Amazon Dash button for Prime members, a simple way to reorder the important things you always run low on so you'll never run out. Set it up to order what you want, then press it when you're running low. Get an order alert on your phone so it's easy to cancel if you change your mind. And with Prime shipping, you'll get new products delivered to your door before you run out and never miss a beat. Prime members, request your free... So one button to roll them on in Amazon is very smart. They use this button to order and in the United States. You can get things really quickly. Within the hour, you just press the button. Just make sure you don't have little kids at home. <laughs> okay. But uh, Amazon is doing a lot of interesting things in this realm of screenless device. So, and here's another uh, device that you get when you are a, a member. Uh, basically, you tell Amazon what you're missing from your fridge, and you create a shopping list. You just speak to the microphone, and you say, okay, I'm missing eggs, and so forth, and you can create a shopping list. And also, you can scan a barcode of, this, of the products you want to buy. If you're running low, you can just scan the barcode, and you notify the system again. More from Amazon is this Amazon Echo, which we all know, and voice commands is getting more and more, voice interfaces is getting more and more predominant in the world of screenless devices. You can just speak to the system, and it knows what you want, and, and it reacts to you. And of course, there are more devices from all these big companies uh, that you know, will enter into our houses and will create a smarter environment without the screen, necessarily. And there's also an emergence of what I call, what we call human behavior as an interface, where the system tracks how you behave, and then it knows to guess, or guesses what, uh, and the most, uh, most uh, known example, of course, is Nest, the smart thermostat that you use for a while. It knows how temper the, the, the temperature preferences that you are. It knows when you're home or not. And after using it for a week or two, you don't have to use it anymore. It remembers your preferences, and you always come home to a comfortable environment. Your, your behavior is the interface. Another example, an experiment they did with the cubes, uh, cube sense, cubes uh, ice cubes that have a light sensor, has light in them. And basically, it measures how much you're drinking. And uh, it starts green, and the more you drink, it becomes red. And then if you keep drinking, it actually sends texts to your friends to not let him drive, okay? <laughs> so an experiment here with human behavior as a sensor. And another, another thing drinking from Amazon. water does all sorts of good things for the body. And getting cleaner, great tasting water just got easier. A Wi-Fi equipped smart pitcher automatically orders replacement filters from Amazon when you need. It's super simple. First, set up your pitcher to connect to your home Wi-Fi network. Since you're connected online, your pitcher is ready to activate. You'll need to log into Amazon to confirm your shipping and billing information. But don't worry, you only have to do this once. Once your pitcher is activated, just fill as you would, and your pitcher tracks your usage. Yes, it's that smart. You can enjoy cleaner, great-tasting filtered water without wondering when the filter needs to be replaced. When a new filter is due, a notification is automatically sent to Amazon for you. So it orders every month, it orders uh, a new uh, filter, and it tracks after your usage. And of course, I mean, this is, I mean, Amazon is really thinking about how to get people to order things uh, from, from their store. Um, so another question is, how do we display information to the user when we don't have a screen? What's, what's the possibilities of displaying information? And uh, 
Of course, in, in the realm of displaying information, there are three categories. The first category is pull, where we know and we use this every day. We pull information to our screen. I don't have to explain when we search. We pull information. This is no need to explain. The second category is for push, when we are pushing information to our screen via uh, pre predefined settings or by our location or by identifying us. And in this space, uh, I wanted to bring back a little bit uh, this movie, Minority Report. Uh, let's see a little scene from this movie. Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to The Gap. How those assorted tank tops work out for you? Mr. Yakamoto. So in this scene, he actually went through and replaced his eyeballs. So he is recognized as Mr. Yakamoto because he stole the eyes from someone else. And he didn't want to be recognized in the space as he walked into the gap. The system scanned his eyes, his retina, and they recognized who he is and they welcomed him. And of course, he could react to the system. Uh, this was a very futuristic at the time it was recorded in what, uh, 2013, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, or, or three. 2003? Yes. And, but they couldn't imagine, even 2003, the best screenwriters, the best director, they couldn't imagine that today, 20 years later, you don't need to retina scan anyone. There's no need for that at all. Actually, the most advanced technological device, they couldn't imagine. Uh, you don't need to scan anyone. Really, what you need is to track someone, but just following their screen, right? We're carrying these devices in our pockets. This is, this is becoming our, our identifier. And if we identify people walking through a shopping mall or in some space, you can do many interesting things. Um, for example, uh, Estimo Beacons uh, does this, and I'm sure the video. The phones we carry around are pretty smart, but they could be a lot smarter. For example, they can connect to a server in another part of the world, but they have no idea that you're in a kitchen, in a conference room, or shopping at your favorite retail store. They lack micro-location context, but now that's changed with Estimo Beacons. They use new Bluetooth smart technology, supported by all major mobile platforms, including the recently announced iOS 7 with iBeacons. Put anywhere in the physical world, they broadcast context and location to all compatible phones and smart devices in range. Phones can now automatically pick up the signal and trigger contextual actions designed by business owners. Customers can enjoy a seamless experience with more information about the products that interest them. Photos, videos, reviews, personalized pricing, and even social updates. As they browse through the store, their phones will transition from one item to the next based on their proximity to the displays, enhancing the shopping experience every step of the way. Also, business owners can now benefit from quantitative location data on visits and customer feedback. Better for business and a better experience for shoppers. If you noticed, um, she has a screen, but she doesn't touch the screen at all. It's all the information is pushed to her screen. And this is a very, very cheap device, but there is new technology, there, there's even Software new. Software of the future will not be created for phones, computers, or tablets. Instead, the developers of tomorrow will use the physical world as their canvas, creating real world applications and on-site experiences designed for one location and easily distributed to many. To make this happen, we need an operating system for the physical world. At Estimote, we are already building its foundations. We started with beacons that are installed in venues, enabling user location coordinates. Then we added stickers, tiny computers attached to objects that trigger events when touched or manipulated. And now we're introducing another layer with Estimote Mirror, the world's first video beacon. When connected to any screen, the display will show personalized content based on people's presence and behavior. For example, in an airport, displays will show information tailored specifically to each traveler's itinerary. Deployed in the smart workplace, Mir will improve collaboration and productivity. In retail, shoppers could be presented with relevant product information based on their past purchase history, or if used with Estimote stickers, which items they've interacted with. And so minority report, right? And if you want to change your identity, Forget just steal someone's phone. Technology, oh. Swedish. But so um, and so identifying. So we understand that identifying people in a digital space can create an environment. You can create an experience based on their specific location. And if we really want to push it further, if we really want to push it to the next level, 
We got to see this moving. Forget wearable technology. Swedish office worker Lynn Kowalaska is having it implanted under her skin. A microchip about the size of a grain of rice is injected into her hand. Uh, it felt pretty scary, but at the same time it feel, felt very modern, very 2015. Instead of ID cards or passcodes, workers who sign up for the implant can now open doors with the wave of a hand. The chip also currently lets workers swap contact details via a smartphone and operate a photocopier. Patrick Mesterton, co-founder of the Epicenter Tech Hub in central Stockholm, sees plenty of future applications for the implant. Like anything where you today would use a pin code or a, or, or a, or a key or a card. So payments is, I think, one area. Uh, I think also for healthcare reasons that you can sort of uh, uh, communicate with your doctor and, and you can get data on what you eat and, and, and sort of what your uh, physical status is. The radio frequency identification chip is made from Pyrex glass and contains an antenna and microchip with no need for batteries. While some workers may feel uneasy at the prospect of literally taking their work home with them, the designers say the chip is completely safe and secure. Uh, you have your own identification code and you're sending that to something else which you have to grant access to. So there's no one else that can sort of follow you on your uh, ID, so to say. It's you who decide who gets access to that ID. The chip is in no way mandatory, and the limited benefits the implant currently offers may put many people off. But with wearable tech becoming more ubiquitous, the merging of biology and technology could represent a growing trend. Now, I think this is crazy. I don't know. I wouldn't use that, I wouldn't do that, but again, you don't need this to identify people, you can have, you know, you can use the phones and so forth, but it was an interesting experiment that they did there, uh, and of course, it's very basic, you can actually give people a headrest, and this is what Walt Disney did to identify who's coming to their parks, they invested one billion dollar to change the entire park system, so people can have experiences based on their identification. Uh, so the way it works is that basically you enter the park and you can pay with it, you can use for it to pay. Uh, this uh, Mickey Mouse is getting in his ear the name of the girl who is hugging and then he can interact with her and speak to her like he knows her, right? And there are very, very interesting things that they are doing in Walt Disney around this identifying people in digital spaces. For example, they can monitor where people are and create faster lanes because they can just understand the traffic in, 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 the, in the park. And in the future, they're actually planning to create maybe a, a, um, a video based on edited uh, um, security cameras that follows you throughout the park and they, they can just ca cut all your great moments and create a video of your, of your vacation uh, in the park based on your location. Um, and remember this movie? Amazon is doing something interesting in that space. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. So you can no see. lines, no checkout. No, seriously.
So you can see that uh, they're using technology to identify someone and to push information to the system, whether they use, they use their uh, cameras and they use sensors and they use their, your location and really they follow you everywhere around the store and they can see through cameras where you put your hand. And in the displaying information category, there are three categories and the third one is the ambient category where we seamlessly interact with at least a minute of our attention with the user. Basically, we show the user, we kind of display to the user somehow in the peripheral so he understands what's going on in the system. Let me explain. Uh, for example, there's the ambient orb. It's a, it is a ball uh, uh, that changes color based on predefined settings. For example, stock market, uh, buy, uh, sell, uh, weather, uh, it, here is an example of, uh, it changes the light based on demand of electricity. When it's most expensive, it's red, and when it's uh, not so expensive, it's blue, so you know when to operate a washing machine, for example. And I think in the future, uh, washing machines will probably will have such sensor already built in, or like a light that tells you these things. Uh, so this is ambient type of display. Another interesting device is the ambient umbrella. Of course, an umbrella is one of the, it's, it's 100 years old, it's a really well-designed um, device, but it has a flaw. You never know when you should take it to outside the house. You never know if it's going to rain or not. You have to check, you have to use your screen, right? You have to take out your screen, you have to uh, look at the, you know, the weather app and see and then guess if you really want to take the umbrella or not, or look at the window and kind of take, uh, take a look. But uh, actually, you don't need to with the ambient umbrella. It has lights. And if some of the lights are on, the umbrella is telling you, take me. And if all the lights are on, really take me, it's going to rain for sure. Okay? So it, it gives you a little bit in the peripheral. If you put the, the umbrella by the door, it knows, oh, I have to take my umbrella with me. Okay? So it's like an ambient type of display. Uh, of course, you can, if you want to know the weather, you can, of course, use uh, the screen. Or uh, you can use a temper scope. It's a little device that tells you what the weather outside. If you don't want to open the window, <laughs> you can always, you know, look at the temper scope. <sighs> so, uh, Bluefit. Bluefit is a is a is a is a is a. Um, sort of a bottle that tells you when to drink and how hydrated you are, and you can see through colors, predefined colors, what's your condition at this current state. Uh, interesting, uh, Provigil Wallet. Provigil Wallet has uh, um, two mechanisms. First mechanism, it has a vibrating motor. And in, in design, context is king. And if we're thinking about wallets, wallet is associated with our money, and our money is associated with our bank, and this is a connected wallet that connects to our bank account. So every time there is a transaction, there's a vibration motor that vibrates in my pocket every time something happens in my bank account. So I know to watch out if there's something that I didn't plan for, I should just check, okay? There's a vibration motor. But it also has this hinge that is connected to our bank balance. So if our bank balance is low, it's really hard to open the wallet. <laughs> okay? But you know, you know. Okay, so you know what's going on. So, ambient information. And in the ambient, uh, I was doing some research in the, on ambient, and I came across this movie, uh, which is uh, a bit ridiculous, but it gives an inspiration of what, uh, what could be an ambient, more, more information about what is ambient. So, ambient furniture, let's, let's watch it. Today's smartphones demand a lot of attention. They're intrusive, distracting, and constantly cause us to drop out of life. The Ambient Furniture Project at the MIT Media Lab asks the question, how do we make interaction subtle and seamless with the least demands on our attention? This line of furniture explores novel ideas about how to use peripheral attention, everyday gestures, glanceability, and subtle incidental interfaces that dovetail with our existing lifestyle. Our first product is the Skype cabinet. It's a beautiful walnut cabinet, and when you open it, you're immediately connected to a friend or family member. Your well-lit, eye-to-eye interaction, high-quality sound. It even glows when they're around. 
Say you're relaxing with friends, recounting your latest trip. Wouldn't it be great if you could quickly show them trip photos? The Facebook coffee table unobtrusively listens to the conversation and displays photos of people and places from your Facebook feed. As the conversation changes, so do the photos. It's a casual way to enhance the conversation. Or take the energy clock. It shows you how your current energy usage compares with your past. A green wedge appears next to the hour hand when you conserve more energy than usual, and it's red if you're being a hog. We all need moments of relaxation to recharge throughout the day. With a Pandora chair, we'll cue the music you just enjoy. The chair tunes into your favorite Pandora stations and plays different songs depending upon your level of incline. Sitting upright, the pace quickens. Leaning back, you'll just enjoy something more peaceful. The Google Latitude doorbell helps your family deal with the end of day chaos. It announces via a subtle chime that your spouse or children are on their way home. Each person in the house has their own chime. Lastly is the Amazon trash can. Just lift the lid, pause to scan, and then toss. The item is automatically reordered from Amazon. It's the future of easy grocery shopping. We are looking for your feedback on these so, ideas, and we're looking for partners to help distribute. Yes, it's ridiculous. I hope that the future will not look like this, but it's great, great like a, a inspiration of what ambient could be, right? And I guess this is the, the point of this movie is to kind of inspire us to think a little bit further beyond just the screens. Um, so that was it. I w hope that uh, you're a bit more inspired right now to think about beyond what's happening in our screens. Uh, the technology is all around us. There are other possibilities. And if you are in the, working on your next project, perhaps consider, put into consideration this idea of how we can relieve stress and not put it on our screens. Uh, I have a group on, fa on Facebook which is called Designing with Sensors. I keep posting interesting stuff I come across that has sensors and um, perhaps if you want to be more inspired uh, after this presentation, join. Uh, look for Designing with Sensors. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you.